I'm really excited to welcome Julia Heberlin to Politics and Prose. Julia is the internationally best-selling and award-winning author of six thrillers. Before writing novels, she was a journalist for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the Dallas Morning News, and the Detroit News, which fed her interest in true crime and the forgotten stories of victims, a theme she carries into her fiction. She currently lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with her family, where she's working on her next psychological thriller. Julia will be in conversation with Amon Batija, senior political editor at Time Magazine. He previously worked as an editor in the New York Times' Washington Bureau and for 15 years as a journalist in Texas, including the first political editor for the Texas Tribune. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife and kids. So please welcome Julia and Amon. This on? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me for to this. I'm really excited to talk to you about your book. I'm thrilled that you're here, as you know. <laughs> uh, first off, I when you when you sent me this book to read, my I, I, I was familiar with some of your earlier books, and this one is about a psychic. Uh, oh. <laughs> this is on yeah. okay great uh so when you sent me this book my first being familiar with some of your earlier books this one's about a psychic which is not the kind of book i would have suggested expected from you what made you decide to want to write about a psychic involved in a murder mystery so i i think of her primarily as an astrophysicist <laughs> with a reluctant psychic leaning mm -hmm. um I wanted to really explore that our belief system mm -hmm. and sort of that area between evidence-based science and the unknown. So I decided a character like this would best help me do that. I wanted the psychic part to be as matter of fact as the science. Um, and, and, and again, I'm kind of a superstitious person myself. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a few little psychic events in my life. I don't know if I should go into any of those because then you might not read the book and think I'm a little crazy. Um, but I, all, I think all of us um, believe in something that's inexplicable, you know, whether it's God or ghosts or someone we loved who has died visiting us, things like that. And what did what was the research like? And because you actually mention in the book uh, investigations where psychics have gotten involved in the past, and uh, I was just wondering how did you learn about all that? You know, so this is a very boring answer in that <laughs> I I googled and researched a lot about psychics, but I really did not interview psychics because I believe probably. 70% of them are scam artists. So most That's of an incredibly generous number. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is why I wanted him. He's a cynic. <laughs> but um, but so most of my research was actually into astrophysics, which don't ask me any questions about that. I learned pretty much enough to just make her an authentic astrophysicist. And mm -hmm. um, I... I use experts all the time, and this happened to be that my cousin is a rocket scientist, and so I interviewed him, and he works with Elon Musk on projects. He happens to be a very intelligent, brilliant man, and I got in. He let me into his beautiful mind, and <laughs> this is what happened. So, so what kind of things were you asking him? That you, what what did you need to know to to make your rocket scientist character believable? First of all, I needed to know what she did for a living, which um, in the end turned out to be she looks for unexplained artificial light in the universe, um, which is kind of a growing field. Instead of listening for sound, they're looking for light. So understanding that process, um, understanding what her daily life would be like, um, understanding what you see when you look into the sky, what are you actually um, looking at? Um, but a lot of my questions were sort of asking them about their philosophical musings about, you know, life and 
God and did they believe in God? And I really didn't expect the answer to be yes, but it was. Mm. You know, my cousin said every day I asked myself, how did God make this amazing thing? Which was, this is what happens when I research is all my stereotypes are blown to part, you know, blown mm -hmm. to bits. Well, and the other kind of aspect of the book that really kind of stuck with me was you have a um, conspiracy theorist podcaster, which it's hard not to read that character and not think of Alex Jones, especially because mm -hmm. it's based in Texas. Uh, and because it's based on him. Actually. Okay, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I expected that, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, what, what made you go there in that terror kind of third rail territory that I know a lot of people just don't like to think about? A, f a friend of mine uh, thought that I needed a crazy conspiracy theorist podcaster in my next book. And she, <laughs> She was a journalist, mm -hmm. and uh, she just um, deluged me with stories about Alex Jones, which was a little overwhelming. I, I listened to Alex Jones and thought, this is really something I'd like to explore, but I don't want to live with this repulsive person in my head for an entire year. So Vivi came out of of that, creating Vivi, someone. Your my, astrophysicist, reluctant psychic. Right. Psychic. Um, and then he became not exactly a bit character. Um, I, I would say a pretty s strong and memorable character. Sure. Um, and he was a lot of fun to write because, uh, you know, getting the cadence of his voice. I mean, he's a horrible person to write, but he was a lot of fun to write for a writer. So, <laughs> well, and, um, as, uh, a political journalist, uh, it is an occupational hazard. Sometimes we have to listen to people like Alex Jones because, they have a newsworthy guest or they're spreading some crazy theory that you're hearing actually from voters when you talk to them and you need to kind of hear how they're getting that misinformation. So I've listened to more Alex Jones than I liked. And mm -hmm. what struck me when reading your uh, scenes with him is you it read like Alex Jones, like you got the, the, the way he spoke, uh, the way that he and a lot of other of his ilk will just so much of what they're doing is just trying to like uh, kind of spread out the stretch out the conversation because they need to they have like one or maybe half an idea and needs to go for like hours. Right. <laughs> um, and so so much of it read like did you listen to a lot of that to kind of get that? I I did understanding that for them it is really pure entertainment. They don't really think about you know the fact that they're ruining people's lives. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yes to that and to just reading about Alex Jones a lot. Um, but with all my characters, it just sort of comes from inside me, someplace mm -hmm. inside me. As you were researching Jones, did, was it kind of what you expected you'd find or, uh, was there anything in there that surprised you about either what his show was like or what he was like? You know, I, um, feel like. He is not as repulsive as the real Alex Jones. Maybe your, his, your character is not. My character is <laughs> is not. Um, uh, you know, and but at the same time, I mean, I pulled in other you know aspects of other mm -hmm. um, uh, podcasters as well. Like you know, the I can't remember his name now, but the podcaster who um, played another one bites the dust during the AIDS crisis when. Uh, famous gay person would die. So, you know, I, I did put those kind of extremes in there. I also wanted to make sure um, that I made it clear where I stood on sort of the unspeakable conspiracy <laughs> theories there are like Sandy Hook and things like that. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to like open up the idea that some conspiracy theories are based on truth and, you know, they're real. I mean, the government really did uh, dosed people unknowingly with LSD in the 60s. And they told all of us that the astronauts had a one in a million chance of dying when they went to the moon, which in my research, I found out that's not true at all. Um, they were most likely to die and it's a miracle they survived. But the government knew that, but didn't tell us. So and this now I'm sounding a little crazy <laughs> myself. <laughs> well, well, but I mean, I, th I think there's an area of where there is tr th that some conspiracy theories are based on a little truth and then they get completely out of control. Well, and in the book, you your characters bring up some conspiracy theories that I thought I knew most of them or nothing they was. And you brought up ones that I'd never heard of and one that I did not know about. And I actually started Googling after I read it because I was like, is that true? Is um, 
I, I've, I've heard the rumors, not the theory that Marilyn Monroe was murdered. I did not know the the, the theory that uh, Robert Kennedy was the one who killed her and was actually nearby when when she died. And that is something you've actually researched. That is something I've actually researched. I mean, there were there were all sorts of odd things with that, and that she um, supposedly killed herself with a lot of pills. I mean, that was in the autopsy, but there was no glass of water or anything to drink near her bed. Uh, the uh, woman who was her housekeeper washed her sheets before the police could get to them. The police took an hour to arrive. Neighbors say they saw Robert Kennedy there. Now, whether... Um, whether she was actually killed by Robert Kennedy, I don't know if I believe that, but I I believe we don't know everything. And that's the frustrating thing, I think, for people who believe in conspiracy theories, is that there is just someone's covering something up who's rich and powerful sometimes. And that and uh, I have to say when you 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 mentioned some of those details in the book, and I was suddenly like, do I think she was murdered? <laughs> <laughs> I know you can convince anybody of anything, <laughs> right? Um, but in the book, uh, the kind of conspiracy theories run wild, and uh, that you have a character who's kind of caught up in that. Did is there anything kind of in was it was it Sandy Hook that kind of made you want to try to write about that idea, and or or something else that kind of inspired you to I think, explore that? I think it's just sort of the underlying anxiety in the world today that we don't know what is true and what is not true. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I wanted to ex explore. Why do people believe in conspiracy theories? You know, um, a need for control over their lives, the fact that they feel they've been lied to, um, a lack of curiosity in finding out what the facts actually are. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that, I wanted to take a look at. So this is your is sixth novel? Yes. And they've all taken place in Texas? That's correct. Uh, could you see yourself writing a book that doesn't take place in Texas? Well, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, I, I feel like um, I, I have this sort of mission to defend Texas in a way, and I'm going to ask you about this as well, <laughs> because he covered Texas politics and is now covering Washington politics, and he says he gets asked all the time, please explain Texas to me. So we want you <laughs> to do that before this is finished. But I have more emotional reasons mm -hmm. for loving Texas because I grew up there, um, and also because I see it so slandered, m because it's just known for its politics, mm -hmm. which are, can be horrible, I you know. Um, so anyway, I, there are 29 million people in Texas. We don't all believe the same thing. You know, there are a hundred languages spoken in Houston. It's one of the leading place for astrophysics because it's in that Southern corridor where they can fling rocket ships, you know, easily, things like that. Well, and that, yeah, that was one of the conspiracy theories that I had not heard of that you know, Elon Musk has uh, SpaceX in Texas and uh, Jeff Bezos has some space thing mm -hmm. in Texas and the conspiracy theory that they're picking Texas as part of some sort of. Well, I made that up. Oh, you did? That's okay. my own conspiracy theory. <laughs> you made it believable because I just assumed I was like, oh, I guess that's one I hadn't heard of yet. <laughs> well, and 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 um, basing your stories in Texas, this one in te Texas in particular, you, you're even able to just take advantage of the vastness of Texas in that. Uh, your main character is an astrophysicist who uh, is an astronomer, you know, is looking up in the sky and needs to go where the big telescopes are. And that is also in Texas, along with everything else right. going on in the story. And she has sort of a lair um, in the Big Bend area with telescopes on the roof. That's one of the darkest places on the face of the Earth. Um, so, I mean, that's the thing about Texas. It's not only diverse um with people, but it's diverse beautifully. I mean, as you know, yeah. with pine trees in one area and, and you know, flat desert in other places. And so I think people see Texas as one thing, just that stereotype, if they haven't been there, that they, you know, see on TV or in a Western or, <laughs> you know, whatever. But you were going to explain Texas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, explain all of Texas. <laughs> no, just explain. When people ask you that question, you know, explain Texas to me. It doesn't look like it's going purple because, you know, they make uh, these incredibly conservative decisions. Yeah, since, since I've been in D.C. for the past few years, I do get a lot of people because 
it seems like about 10, 15 years there have been a storyline of Texas is going to turn blue at any moment, and it never seems to happen. It always seems almost to go in the opposite direction, and people can't understand why. And I, I, I the big part of it that I've always found is, um, you know, that there's a there's a analogy used for Texas of the sleeping Texas is a sleeping giant. There's uh, these hundreds of thousands of people that don't vote. Texas voter participation is horrible, and that that's why it's so red. And if those people would just vote, a lot of them Hispanics, the, the state would turn purple or maybe blue. And the thing that everyone always misses out of that is, um, yes, there are tons of people that don't vote, and that and a lot of them are Democrats. There are also tons of Republicans that don't vote because Republicans win everything. So they just don't bother voting. Mm -hmm. And if so, anytime there's a race that's close, like, um, like Ted Cruz and Bader work was the most recent example a few years ago, there are thousands and thousands of Republicans who never vote and suddenly hearing, oh my God, a Democrat's gonna win, I better go vote. So um, that is like the idea of like a blue wave taking over Texas uh, misses the fact that whenever a blue wave gets close, a red wave comes up and <laughs> makes it even harder to cross. It's not what I wanna hear. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I grew up in a house that was very liberal. My dad is 93 and he's mm -hmm. still writing letters against the death penalty um oh, no. to, to, to his hometown newspaper and was like the only person <laughs> i'm pretty sure in the entire town who put a beto o'rourke sign in his yard but you know when you're 93 you can do whatever you want right <laughs> in texas well also there's a there's a misunderstanding of texas um you hear so much about the, the state legislature is it is very red um and it, they do push very conservative policies but what I struck me when I moved to DC is that um, the two parties they they tend to get along better in Texas than they do in Washington. In Washington, you know, the there's a Speaker of the House, whatever party they are, their party picks all the committee chairs, um, and you don't actually see a lot of uh, Democrats socializing with Republicans. At least as of a few years ago, in the Texas legislature, uh, there is a lot more socializing, even if they don't get along politically. You'll see much more them going out to dinner together, different parties, and um, and whoever's speaker makes a point of making uh, members of both parties committee chairs. Uh, and I think that's kind of reflective in the culture of the people too, mm -hmm. um, because you know there were there's so much divisiveness after Trump, but people seem to be able to be more likely to find the thing they have in common or the thing they could maybe change about the other person that they wanted to. I mean, I, I see that in my very red suburb where I live um, because people say, how, how can you stand to live there? Or how can you have a friend who voted for Trump or you know all, all of that? But there is, I think, sort of an effort to understand each other. Um, and you know, I would say that all those Republican um, uh, representatives in Texas are all those boys who sat in the back of my class who were not very bright and made C's in science. And, and because we don't care enough, sometimes we don't vote them out of office. We don't see it as important. And that's a very bad thing about Texas. Um, I, I, I staying in the road of politics just a little longer. Uh, you, your, your Alex Jones character, whose name is Bubba Bubba Guns. Bubba Guns, yes. Um, I love that name, by the way. <laughs> uh, at one point, he uh, he's talking about Molly Ivins, this you know liberal icon in Texas, uh, and he uh, he used this phrase. I, I can't write down. Uh, oh, Molly Ivins, God bless her misguided political soul. Mm. And then he goes on to praise her and actually talk like uh, um, uh, fondly of her, which was something I'd noticed in Texas that you don't you see much less in Washington, which is that. Uh, a tendency for people to find appreciation for the other side um, politically, just not about their politics. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, just I've, I've, I've heard that phrase, God, I've heard variations of that phrase, like, God bless their misguided soul. <laughs> right. Yeah, some people consider that an insult. If you say God bless, they figure that they're saying F you, I right. think, really. But, um, but yeah, but Molly Ivins is interesting in herself because she had this like huge Texas accent and she went to Smith and studied in Paris and was from California. So she really understood that to win in Texas, it was, you know, not about geography, but about identity. Well, and in the book, you, know, you kind of compare her uh, somewhat to the uh, Bubba Gunn's character. You, you, uh, someone brings up the idea of um, uh, when you get to that level of 
uh, political discourse, it's all performance art. Right. Um, which I thought was a really kind of keen observation that uh, people tend to miss of with the people they prefer politically, they think of them as authentic, and the other side are all scammers. And it's the same on both <laughs> sides, pretty much. Um, so this book has been, uh, I think we're allowed to talk about, it has been optioned for a TV show? Yes, Fo Fox Network has um, bought it at, for a TV series. They um, hope, uh, uh, in the beginning, well, not in the beginning, well, when I was starting out, they really wanted limited series, and now they're looking for actual series that will continue. So I have very much hope that this will go for more than one season. They're, they were highly enthused about the characters specifically. Um, I think she's one of my best and most complex and passionate characters. So we'll see if that happens. You know, there is a Hollywood strike and <laughs> now the actors are striking too. So that just sort of slows the whole process. And so the hope is that um, this character of Vivi, the psychic slash astrophysicist would find more cases beyond the the one the ones in this book yes and there is something a little untied at the end of this particular mm -hmm. book which they think will make the second season so, so. Is it, is, does that mean we you may uh, write more about her i would like to but that's sort of the publishing the publisher's prerogative in a way um i always wanted to write a series character but if you know if say this book doesn't sell as well as they want they people typically don't want to go back and read the first book mm -hmm. first you know unless this particular book did you know astonishingly well which of course we hope it does well everyone's so, gonna buy a copy obviously yeah <laughs> of course <laughs> uh so what is it about vivi that you think um kind of excites you about potentially writing more about her i i think exploring um both the, the the psychic aspect of her life, which again is treated very matter of factly. I, you know, people who typically don't want to read a book about psychics, and I even asked you this, what did you think about this element? In the beginning you said, you know, well, maybe it was kind of a device. You thought it was going to be kind of a device, but in reality, it's part of the complexity of her character. So, so that and learning more about science myself, which is the universe, it's just fascinating to me. So I will. So yeah, when I started your book, my first thought was um, me and my wife used to watch this show called Medium, which I don't know if anyone remembers. With I think it was Patricia Arquette. Yes. And it was a fun show of a psychic helping uh, solve crimes. But I remember watching the show, and the same thing would happen over and over again, where the cops would either get a warrant or she would like testify, and it would be her visions was the evidence, which made no sense whatsoever. Right. <laughs> and so I remember starting your book and I think, you know, oh God, I hope that doesn't happen here. And I, have to, <laughs> I have to pretend I don't care about, I, I think that's fine. <laughs> but no, you that never happens in the book. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I, I, I was actually, was that kind of um, a challenge to have this character whose, whose visions uh, are, you know, helping, her kind of move forward in an investigation, but not actually, but in a way that they can actually move forward in an investigation in a way that's more uh, of an appropriate way to, you know, yes. get, get and, and I think it's because she's not always sure herself mm -hmm. about whatever is happening. And, and sometimes what she um, imagines, part of it's true, but the other part isn't. So it's not mm -hmm. this just sort of, you know, Every, you know, I, I, um, I discovered this and this is true and, you know, voila, you know, mm -hmm. voila, it's, you know, the answer. It's not like that at all. She's never sure she has the answer. And, you know, the psychic part, you know, there's some, there are weird things that have happened to me, surely to you as well. Um, and in this, this book, something strange happened to me, which is that, um, and my husband's here to prove that it is true because he was there when it happened but uh, the character's name is vivian rose and um i knew her second name the day before my uh, nephew told me um the name of the daughter who was born that day and it, her name is vivian rose and i can't even explain that how can that be i mean i gave her a second name the day before the baby was born 
So, you know, I know. So you don't believe me, but it's true. You can prove it. So, I mean, yeah, I think things, and I don't know if you think things like this too, but my mother um, died a couple of years ago and there's this monarch butterfly that hangs out with me sometimes for long periods of time. And she had this beautiful wild garden and monarch butterflies would land on her bean poles in during migration season mm -hmm. by the hundreds. It was amazing. So I feel this connection to monarchs and I wonder why this monarch is hanging out with me specifically and think, you know, maybe that is, you know, a piece of me. And the scientist, my cousin, thinks it could be too. So, you know, it's a, I know you don't, but I mean, some of it's wishful thinking, but some of it can't be explained. Since the book uh, has come out, have you had any reactions that have surprised you? Either, I'm curious about either on the, the, the psychic aspect of it or the conspiracy theory, Alex Jones aspect, just anything that you've heard from readers that surprised you or you found un unexpected? And the enthusiasm for the character, you never know until the book is finished and readers have, you know, let you know what mm. they think. Um, I think that surprised me that she is their favorite of the characters that I've mm. created. So they must have liked the complexity of the two things. Mm. Um, and, I, and I do get, you know, emails from readers who say this happened to me. Isn't this weird? You know, oh, wow. so, you know, <laughs> writing the next book for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, well, did, uh, this has been great. Do we want to open it up to questions? Sure. Uh, by the way, uh, Alex Jones is also uh, based in Texas. Um, what do you think of the idea that both conspiracy theory and psychics uh, serve a useful purpose in that they promote uh, motivational thinking and they actually help uh, things get accomplished? That's a really great question. And I would say, yes, I think that's true. I mean, to me, um, you know, there's just a fine line between science and, and the unknown and that um, science would not exist without people who don't have enormous imaginations and you know wild imaginations and who believe in the unknown so i don't think science could be pushed forward without this kind of crazy thinking in a way so is that what you think yes yeah <laughs> okay i'm going to just say this is my former <laughs> boss um, who i haven't seen in about 30 years, I don't know maybe how, not long. maybe but, not that long, a very long time. He was one of the first people who ever believed in me before I believed in myself, and that's true. Thank you for coming. She is so smart that it's very easy to believe in her talent. Mm. Uh, Julie, you, in this book, you've, you're talking about Alex Jones and other real people, and in your previous books, uh, and I've read most of them, there obviously is a lot of research about the realities of what your characters might be into from photography to whatever. Am I sensing that maybe in the future there is a nonfiction work in your uh, repertoire? I mean, are you thinking about historical fiction or are you thinking about, well, maybe it's time for biography? I'm just curious if your mind is thinking in that way. You know, I've, I've thought about, um, I've, I've thought about biographies and I've thought um, a lot about true crime and writing a true crime book because of my journalism background um, that is a sort of more beautiful narrative um, or told in a, an unusual way. Um, he asked me what I wanted to do next before this and I said I want to write the Pulitzer Prize winning literary novel that is only 40,000 words that takes me three months to write. So, <laughs> but um, doesn't everyone want to write that? Um, so, I mean, I try to bring a little of the literary to the thriller um, genre, and it's, the research is so important to me um, that it's accurate. And so any of the characters that I write about, a forensic scientist, I, the, the book is dedicated to a woman named Rhonda Roby, this particular book, but she helped me with a previous book called Black Eyed Susans. And she um, 
worked at 9-11 and um, worked serial cases and mass uh, plane casualty cases and is just this incredibly humane person. And if I did not research real people who do these things, my books would be so very shallow um, and narrow in thought. And, you know, again, they just blow apart my stereotypes and add a kind of depth I couldn't do by myself. Yeah, you mentioned you're a scientist, especially an astrophysicist, yeah. believing in Big Bang, universe, creation of the creation of the world, planet Earth. And uh, my question is, I'm a skeptic, and I read a lot of uh, skeptical magazines like Skeptical Enquirer and uh, Richard Dawkins and all those people. So they usually dismiss off like this kind of uh, psychic power and... Uh, uh, conspiracy theories as BS and uh, so what is your reaction on that and what was your colleagues uh, astrophysicist reactions to your uh, writing about the psychic power you believe in that or for fiction you wrote that okay so I am no astrophysicist first oh. I I used uh, my cousin who was a rocket scientist uh -huh. Um, for all the astrophysics in this in oh, this book, right. uh -huh. so um, but he had surprising answers for me about things like, you know, do you believe in aliens? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you believe in God? Um, those kinds of things. He was not as skeptical as I thought he would be about mm -hmm. them. That's kind of what I expected. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I I. I am a skeptic too. I mean, I'm a journalist. Uh -huh. So when I lean into this, I tend to lean into only the things that I think are possible. Uh -huh. um, so because, well, we don't know, right? There's so many things we don't know and we don't know about science and are disproven about science. Um, uh -huh. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I mean, you say you're a skeptic, so you what are the things you're skeptical of? What are some of the things? Any of these psychic power and conspiracy theories, anything not based on science and facts, those which are just people trying to tell from their mind and all. Now that you know our uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the famous author of Sapiens, has written out of the book saying that all these things like emotions, free will, feelings, all of those now the biotechnology has proved has got some kind of a chemical hormonal basis for that. And uh, soon, you know, uh, the biotechnology and the information technology is going to take over our bodies and tell what we have and all those things. So in that situation, uh, what I want is, is there any chemical basis for these people to believe in all these uh, psychic power and uh, well, I think I agree with you I think there are a number of people who are completely lost in the idea that they can see or know things um, mm -hmm. that they can't mm -hmm. um, and it's a way for them to kind of be something important okay. um, so you know at my uh, Fort Worth actually Dallas event, they had two psychics come to the event. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, you know, I thought this was, you know, that's kind of good marketing, right? Um, and at the end, I had my own reading. And, you know, I could tell she, you know, I was thinking this is really just a scam, right? And the first thing she said was, your husband has a very big surprise for you. It's a good one which I knew was not true. <laughs> <laughs> and the second was, have you seen a doctor lately? And I thought, what a horrible psychic you are. You know? <laughs> so believe me, I'm on board with you, but okay. I just wanted to kind of explore this space okay. between the two things. And the fact that this character doesn't really know what she believes herself, mm -hmm. I think, is what makes the book more believable. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Where are the books? I'm oh. <laughs> I don't know where they are. Maybe at the front? All right. Thanks a lot, you guys, for coming. Really appreciate it.